um, video video is encouraged. Uh, we're going to do a round of introductions that cover just a very small uh, small bit about um, sort of where uh, well you know who you are and where you're kind of at in your historical fencing journey. Um, I've done a number of these lectures, and and more often than not, it's like not for a, a club specifically, but rather for um, a, you know a sort of diaspora, and sometimes that involves like. Uh, talking about where you're from and kind of what your practice is. We don't have to do that this time, I guess, because everyone's basically from the same club with the exception, uh, with the exception of some of my guys that are joining us for the lecture. But, uh, but yeah, if I could, I'll, I'll start going down um, the list. And then if you're not, uh, if you're not talking, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to mute. But also throughout the presentation, if you have some something to kind of, um, uh, if you know, if I ask a question or I'm encouraging people to speak, then please go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself and chime in if you have something interesting to say. Um, but the whole idea of keeping yourself on mute is just to kind of keep, uh, and I think the Zoom software does a pretty good job of, of managing that, but just to keep everyone kind of focused on the same thing. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll begin. And I, and well, so why don't we just start with Craig, if you could, Craig, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and um, about kind of what kind of fencing you do, what kind of martial arts experience you have? And yeah, we'll take it from there. Oh gosh, uh, right off the bat. Uh, hi, I'm Craig Kellner. Uh, I've been doing HEMA off and on for a couple years now. Uh, I started uh, back in 2017 for a couple months, then moved uh, to Boston. And I was at Boston Armazari for about a year there. Then I moved down to Virginia and joined up with CKDF back in 2018. And, you know, life comes and goes, but I'm one of those multi interesting people and a local heretic who actually likes Fiore. <laughs> Super cool. All right, thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, hi, I'm Steve. Um, I've been with CKDF for a couple of years now. Um, I'm a short guy with a wrestling background who uh, doesn't exercise as much as he should. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say. Great. Uh, how long have you been doing Spencing? About three years. Awesome. And you've been with CKDF the whole time? Yeah. Cool. Right on. Thank you. Travis? Hi. So um, I started way, way back with sport fencing in middle school into early high school. And then I took a very, very long break from anything fencing related all through uh, end of high school and all through college. But then I got into uh, antique sword collecting, and I found out around the same time that HEMA was a thing. But I didn't start until I moved to D.C. and started going to CKDF about, um, I guess it's been about 18 months I've been with CKDF now. And um, I've done more one-handed stuff than anything else because sport, uh, sport fencing was pretty transferable to that. So I feel like I had an easier time picking up some of the uh, savory stuff for HEMA, but I'm um, still working on my long sword and trying to get a little bit more polished with that. Cool, great, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna add one more thing and uh, we don't have to re regress, but just for, um, for those of you who are gonna give you a little introduction. Also, if you could include whether or not you've taken a class of any sort with me, just so that I um, can try and keep that straight in my mind if I am supposed to remember you or not. Um, so but yeah, we'll just, we'll, 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 uh, we'll go forward with that. Marlene, we'll start with you with the, with the new format. Okay. Um, so technically no, um, you kind of gave me a crash course in your uh, Lichtenauer's five words that you were going to do uh, with CKDF because I couldn't make it. Um, so I've been with CKDF since I think 27, it's 2017. Um, and I've dabbled in quite a few weapons. Um, my favorites, like if I had to rank them, it would be like 
wrestling dagger longsword <laughs> um because wrestling is the best and everybody should do it <laughs> um so as far as where i am in my hema study now it's like i feel like i have enough of a basis that i can really go back and read the sources and kind of like i have a better foundation as far as understanding what they're talking about um and like how they're using their language to describe what we should be doing as actions or positions as opposed to when I first started. Cool, great, thank you. Uh, Will? Hey, sorry, a little bit loud. If it's loud, sorry. I'm, I'm William Busher. I've been with uh, CKDF for, for about five years now. Um, that's my extent of fencing experience, really. Never really done any martial arts before that. Um, and I think, yeah, James, I have taken a class with you informally at an F and Y pass where we did uh, Meyer staff stuff. Um, and that was really cool. I still remember that. Um, and let's see, uh, I like to approach uh, my study of HEMA in terms of um, learning a language. I think that, uh, that learning a language is, a, is very analogous to, because um, there's a system in, in at least the, the KDF system that I study is a, is a way of describing a fight or a fencing match. Um, it's a way to, to, to you know, ascribe uh, language to movement. And so that, that's how I approach it. Cool, great, that's awesome. Bob? Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob Powers. Looks like he might have froze. Oh, okay. All right, we'll come or back. We're holding very still. We'll come back to Bob and Joe. You're muted, yeah. Yeah, click off on the button. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe. I've been doing this for, let's see, about five years at this point, just a little bit over. Uh, I did a little bit of sport fencing when I was younger, but like not much, but it certainly helped getting started. Um, primarily KDF, Longsword, messed around with a bunch of other stuff, but nothing with quite the same source specificity. Um, Oh, and yes, I have taken classes from you, one at FNY on Myers Rapier, the seminar you gave to KDF last year, I guess that was. Geez, that was almost a year ago now, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think those two, yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, Gina, you're up. Uh, hi, I guess I've been learning fencing for almost a year and a half now. I was doing rapier with you, James, for that time. And then I recently started learning quarterstaff. And that's about all I got. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you, Gina. All right. P uh, whoa, Peter? Yeah, Peter Kale. Is it Kale? Is that right? Close enough. Um, I'm Peter. Uh, I've been with KDF for, what, three years, give or take? Um, I've done a few martial arts before that, but mostly concentrating on longsword with KDF, uh, also doing some polearm and dagger and a little bit of messer. Um, I did do, I did, uh, show up for your, uh, seminar when, or your thing at, at, on a Monday night, um, last year, I guess it was, but, uh, that's about it, I guess. Okay, great. Thanks. Brent? Uh, so I'm Brent. Um, I've been I've been with CKDF and been doing HEMA for about five years now. Uh, I started in summer of 2015. Um, I guess my primary focus, like a lot of people here, would be um, you know longsword in the early Lichtenauer tradition, but uh, I also do ringen, um, or I did it before you know this pandemic happened. Um, and I believe I've taken one class with you before, and that was when you did uh, your seminar last year okay. back at CKDF. Great. Thank you, Brent. Uh, John? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Brent? Joe, can you help me remember, did I show up to CKDF before or after you? I think 2015 or so? I, I'm so senile. That's the premise here. You predated me. Okay, so I think it was early 15. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I made my first uh, sword out of a 
two by four in 1985 when I was 15. Uh, premise here is I'm old, so everything I want to say is based around uh, being old. Uh, I've been playing with weapons ever since. I uh, joined the Marines in 89, and so that consumed much of my martial arts, a lot of uh, military training. And then I finally got out in uh, 2012, stumbled into CKDF, and fell immediately in love. Uh, I do everything with CKDF, you name it. Uh, I, I love to play with it. Messer, longsword, rapier, ringing, uh, dagger, whatever. It's all amazing. I'm hoping to get in a harness sometime here, but uh, it's just a time suck. And I believe I've taken a class with you. I, I've been to FNY before. Uh, you might have taught it at a long point or so, but you see my foot from there. I'm just, again, I'm senile and old, so can't quite remember. But uh, I believe you might have taught me at FNY. And okay. yeah, that's me. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Liz. Uh, I've been with CKDF for about four years with some kind of long breaks for some injuries. Uh, mainly German longsword. I don't believe I've taken any classes with you before. I did do some sport fencing in college, modern French and Italian style fencing. Uh, and I guess my approach to HEMA is basically about understanding the past. Since uh, pretty much everybody before the early 20th century went around armed and was trained in arms to some extent. Great. Uh, let me see, I think um, we got a few people left. We got Cynthia. Yes, good evening. Actually, it's my wife's account. My name is John Dottle. Okay. I've been in HEMA off and on for several years. I kind of started off with Joe Lilly at another local club, and I'm just a recent one to K KDF. Um, have done so, probably a long sword and a little bit of army sword, and a little bit of sword and buckler, a dusak, um, a little bit of basic rapier, and I've kind of evolved into a little bit of highland broadsword. And a military historian, retired military officer. So kind of this is a, you know, kind of a look with the evolution of swords and weaponry in general, uh, just besides the history. And um, I actually won't show you my picture because I'm laying up in bed just getting over hip replacement surgery. Oh, so wow. my military career has finally caught up with me. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm on the, uh, well on the mend. I'm glad to hear that. All right. I know I have not had a class with you before. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, and Emily. Sure. Hi. Um, I started in 2017 at CKDF. Hey guys. <laughs> uh, now I'm in LA. Um, I, uh, I do mostly longsword. Um, I have a history of just sports dabbling in general. Um, uh, yeah, I just started doing some staff. We do dagger, some, some messer. Um, I'd say my approach is mostly sports sporting but trying to channel it into a, a little bit more studious approach i've never taken a class with you great thanks so there's one there's one more um miss mystery here uh and it's goes by tn ipad uh as a mom. yeah that's me and sorry ted nakata okay um ckdf for several years uh, did sport fencing in high school and college, Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, started several years ago with CKDF. Uh, <clears throat> actually wanting to know, hey, you hear all about how they used to fence or use long swords or arms in the old days. What did that really mean? So thanks to shoulder injuries, my focus has really been on single stick, rapier, uh, messer. Uh, would like to get back to a long sword, but uh, working up to it. Okay. And I've not taken a class from you. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, I it think... looks like Bob was able to join back. Awesome. All right, Bob, you there, Bob? Yes. I had a computer thing, and it's yep. it's uh, hopefully back. So you're actually the last. You're you're the last one, and you didn't miss a beat. So three. So the, yeah. The I'm Bob Powers. Um, I've been doing sword stuff for. Uh, five years on and off. So I did two years when I was in Boston doing my MA. And then, so um, I did it with Forte. So somebody mentioned um, Boston Armitari. I, I knew some of the guys from there. 
And then um, I took two years off, moved to uh, Kenosha area, and uh, I've been doing just over a year with James. So I've taken a class or two with you, um, if you remember me. <laughs> and uh, other than that, I mean, w where it's relevant, which is very infrequently, I am studying medieval philosophy still. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I, I will say that it will likely be at least uh, tangentially re relevant to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, mm -hmm. But I will go ahead now and I will explain myself. My name is James Riley. I have been doing historical fencing uh, somehow or another since 2009. I watched the movie Reclaiming the Blade and it changed my life forever. So um, anyone who's ever taken any class with me knows that. Now you all know that. Uh, I immediately dropped like $600 on a startup kit, such as it was at the time, which was like a wooden sword from Purple Heart, no, excuse me, from New Sterling Arms, and uh, some lacrosse gloves, and some padded paintball pants, and a jacket from Absolute Force, um, a coach's jacket that was just an abomination. I think I still own it. Uh, it's a really, really horrible, horrible jacket. Um, since then, the community's grown so much and changed so much, and a lot of those, uh, a lot of the, the uh, issues, at least with gear, that were prob problematic then are um, not quite as problematic today. Uh, but anyway, um, so my focus in, in historical fencing, kind of as is often the case, uh, I began my journey with, with longsword because longsword for, for a long time, I think was kind of iconic. It, it, it kind of symbolized what it meant to be a historical fencer, right? Um, and part of the reason for that is because up until HEMA, right, uh, up until sort of like a revolution in the way that we approach swordsmanship that began in like the 70s or 80s with sort of uh, a focus on source material and reconstruction and that kind of thing, um, we still had swordsmanship. Like there was a, trad a living tradition of swordsmanship that existed and uh, in both the sport fencing traditions, the modern Olympic sport fencing traditions that exist today, and also the classical traditions, uh, which also exist today, um, still and up until this day, and are thriving. Uh, and uh, in those traditions, or at least in, we'll say, uh, in the classical tradition, there was sort of a, uh, mostly a small sword focus, but also a, a um, you know, uh, the, the idea of the rapier was associated with, uh, with classical fencing. And there was a lot of people at the time that were kind of preserving and doing kind of a, a reconstruction of sorts of rapier traditions that were more easily accessible uh, from manuals and, and stuff like that. So, so uh, when HEMA happened, and we'll say the 70s up through the 90s and early 2000s, it sort of, it, the way that it manifested was through the reconstruction of longsword systems from the medieval and early Renaissance period, right? Um, and so because of that, that's what I picked up that like everyone else, I picked up a longsword and I said, no, I'm doing historical fencing. And that's kind of been uh, underneath most of what, uh, most of what I've done since then. Although I, um, I kind of have expanded my own fencing beyond longsword to kind of, um, you know, out in the direction of the other weapons, other weapons in the KDF tradition. And I include Jochen Meyer in the KDF tradition. So that includes all of the uh, weapons that he teaches in his book, Art of Combat, which include uh, longsword, dusak, rapier, staff, halberd, pike, um, wrestling, and dagger. Uh, so that's, that's what I do in historical fencing. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Lichnauer uh, Kunstesfechtens tradition. That's what I taught to a number of you guys uh, last year. Uh, that's what I teach to, to my club. And, I, and basically what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to uh, come up with a really robust analytical framework for understanding the fight based on, uh, based on what I see as being sort of prevalent throughout the tradition. Uh, it's always hard to say like this is that 
that this is a discrete concept. You know, we always, um, we, we, we as modern minds tend to see things as discrete because of lots of reasons, but probably mass communication being the foremost reason. Uh, historically, that's not the way things were viewed uh, to say that, that there is this thing called indes, right? We kind of, we have discussions and arguments and sometimes get really angry about what someone believes, whether or not what we believe indes is approaches the truth about what it is, like this essential nature of this thing, Indes, right? And uh, certainly in the period of the sources that we're reading, that's not the way that they looked at it. They had their manuscripts and they had their own network, their own map in their mind about what, how these concepts worked and how they were interrelated. And, um, and, and, and they were often different. They were often different. So part of the project, part of the historical fencing project is try and, get a, try and get a better sense, a richer and more nuanced sense of what it is that we're trying to reconstruct. And part of that is coming is a reconciliation. It's a coming to terms with the fact that um, maybe there's, maybe this thing that we're trying to reconstruct existed in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. Maybe it's not as simple as just saying, this is what they meant that uh, they is a sort of arbitrary category. Um, and that really what we ought to do is we ought to um, try and think more deeply and more critically about how some of these ideas might have been present and what the function of, of the swordsmanship was in the societies that we're studying, which is how I arrived at this training topic, right? So um, a few years ago, uh, well, really since the very beginning, but mostly like a few years ago. Uh, Internet flame war kind of got rolling uh, and, it, and it concerned itself with the question of whether or not the fencing systems that we're doing right now, that we're trying to reconstruct, that we're reading, in the, reading about in the sources, particularly those of us who are involved in the KDF tradition, which is everybody here, uh, even if we have some people who are uh, have an affection for other systems, um, right? Whether or not that system is a martial system or a sport system, right? So that is the dichotomy. Whether or not what we're doing is for real martial arts, which means killing in the streets, or whether it's for something else. Uh, and then whatever that is, no matter how that's manifest, right? We're gonna call that sport, right? Because that's the only way that we can conceive of something other than killing people in the streets in the 21st century is uh, if it isn't that, it's, it must be sport. And so I was immediately unhappy with that question or with that dichotomy rather, right? This false dichotomy from my perspective, this false dichotomy of whether or not it's martial as defined basically some arbitrary way um, or as projected on by us given our culture in the 21st century um, or sport. And so I, I, I really became concerned with that question and I, and I tried to find an answer in the source material. I tried to deduce an answer from the, uh, from what seems to be apparent in the source material, like, um, and when you when you do it that way, very often uh, you're led into a sort of dilemma, right? So the dilemma is, on the one hand, we don't know what the hell these sources are trying to tell us. We have no idea. Like that's the whole project, right? Is we're trying to figure out what the sources are trying to tell us, and so in order to do that, we have to begin with some set of assumptions. And those assumptions are going to help inform the way that we interpret the text, right? Um, and so it's, it's a paradox then to, 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 to say, what I'll do is in order for me to figure out whether or not it's for killing in the streets or for sport is I'll read it. And then it will objectively tell me that, right? Because I'm, I have to begin with the premise that it is for one thing or another thing, 
before I can infer from the text in the first place, right? So you, you guys, uh, hopefully, some of you guys are nodding your head and saying like, yeah, okay, I see, I see the dilemma here, right? I see the paradox. Right? You, can't, you, you can't put the first thing, you can't put the second thing in the first thing, right? Okay, so, so, so that was sort of um, the way I was thinking about whether or not I could find an answer in the text. And so what I decided was, how about I look for what fencing was in context? And so I'll look at other references to fencing um, that were sort of extra the sources, right? Or uh, um, external to the sources that I'm studying as far as reconstructing fencing systems to see what those people said about what fencing was. And what I saw as a tendency was this idea that fencing uh, was grouped alongside various activities that were, um, that fell within an, a developmental or educational continuum, right? So fencing, Belongs in a cat and uh, belongs as a, as a, as a subcategory of a, of a broader category of various things that you can do to uh, to better yourself. Um, generally, it's it's uh, a it's a broader category of things that you can do to better yourself martially, right? Um, but beyond that, even still, uh, it was very much concerned with sort of like education. So, for instance, if we're looking at uh, you, you know, um, tales related about specific people and their fencing education went alongside various other forms of education. So I began to see fencing as, uh, as a tool for personal development rather than a, uh, ra rather than a system for um, doing the martial thing, right? Uh, uh, specifically, right? But, um, and, 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 and instead, look at fencing as sort of one smaller part of a broader category of things that we can do to make ourselves better, whatever, better men at arms, better soldiers. Um, and one direction that we could go with this lecture could be like deep down that rabbit hole and talking about all of the various sources that caused me to, to arrive at that conclusion. I'm going to touch on some of them, but I'm not going to spend the majority of this um, talk discussing exactly what those sources are. But, I, but I'll begin with um, sort of the, uh, we'll, we'll start with this, this, broader category, this broader category. It's called the seven probates. Um, so it, I think it's important for us as historical fencers to understand what the seven probates are. The seven probates are seven uh, parts of a physical training, of a, of, a, of a nightly physical training continuum that are expressed in various sources beginning, so far as I can tell, uh, as explicitly as the seven probates with uh, 1408 is an arbitrary date that they've given to the, the, um, the night, the mirror of the night. The mirror of the night goes down and lists the probates specifically, um, what they are. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll just briefly say that they involve some, some of the things that have sort of come up over and over and over again in all physical training res regimens throughout antiquity, at least in Western history, right? So those involve stone throwing, leaping, wrestling, uh, various strength training activities um, by the by the fourteen um, by, by the fourteenth and fifteenth century. They're talking specifically about shooting, uh, singling out shooting, um, or like aiming, a, aim uh, the practice of aiming. Um, and targeting specifically. Also um, stuff that has to do with horsemanship, stuff that has to do with, uh, with running, swimming, th those kinds of things. Another thing that comes up time and time again, which we will talk about in this discussion, is gonna be dancing. Uh, that's featured prominently on the list of, of, uh, seven, of the seven probates. And also tournamenting, uh, which we can kind of just think about as we can kind of think about as competition more generally because tournaments over the course of their lifespan in the medieval period and into the Renaissance period, tournaments um, 
mean a lot of different things. They're manifest a lot of different ways. Sometimes they're manifest in, in a sort of similar way that we can see them in the 21st century. Other times they're like totally different and it's not even useful to think of, think of them as tournaments. But uh, we can just generally think of like a formal competition. So to tournamenting is as a formal competition, right? Okay. The so shooting and the targeting, is that focused on archery or so, uh, archery, um, the right, guns of the time? Archery and 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 uh, guns, crossbow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think specifically in the. Um, so so remember these these probates right? These seven areas of focus are going to be they make their first appearance in maybe fourteen oh eight or whatever. But then they're they keep on being reiterated right up until um, the Enlightenment and the sort of overhaul of German education in the seventeen hundreds. Right, so um, for instance, we see the seven probates in Talhofer's recommendations for what you can do as a knight, or in um, in Jörg Willem Hutter also lists the seven probates. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about why seven, right? Where that where that comes from. Uh, I'm gonna offer uh, I'm gonna offer a bit of space for anyone to take a guess if they have one why there might be seven probates, what the function of that would be. An yeah. echo of the trivium and quadrivium. There you go, right? Uh, why? I mean, so I don't want to go too far into depth as, uh, with regards to that, but you're going to see that kind of number come up over and over and over again. And it's, um, if we think of the seven, the seven liberal arts, for instance, or the seven mechanical arts, right? Of which, so uh, if specifically, if we talk about the seven mechanical arts, military matters, um, almost like this whole, this whole question that we've identified with the seven probates fall as one of the seven of the seven mechanical arts, right? Uh, and the seven mechanical arts go as far back as um, the fifth century, I believe. Uh, but then those are reader. And what's also important to note about, let's say, the seven mechanical arts is that the list changes over time. So uh, early in various iterations, the um, agriculture is a prominent member of this, uh, of this grouping. But then that goes away and uh, navigation becomes one of them. So, you know, they're preserving the number. I think that's important because I think that helps us, um, I think it helps us frame how we should think about this group. Uh, so it helped me rather. When I began, I saw this list and I said, well, that's it. I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna do the seven things on this list. I'm, and, that, and then I'm gonna be a well-rounded uh, well person. And I think uh, whether or not I do that, um, I don't think that I'm going to get, uh, become maybe more well-rounded or more like those people, I think that it's just a framework that they were kind of beholden to at the time and it became less, less useful for me going on. So really what I, um, what I wanted to look at is the specific things on, uh, on this list of the seven probates and see how they're manifest earlier um, and see how they're manifest into the modern period. And, um, and I've, I found some really interesting things. So the, the, the meat and potatoes of this list, uh, for instance, leaping as a part of formal training, uh, throwing of various things, heavyweight training, uh, wrestling, um, marching, weighted marching, weighted jumps, uh, and various weighted exercises. All of these things have a history that goes way further back than the first iteration of this list, right? Uh, really, we kind of can, can think of Galen. Uh, Galen of, begins with a P, I can't remember. Uh, shoot, I might even just look it up for you real quick. Uh, he was a second century Roman uh, writer who detailed a ton of exercises, Galen. Uh, 
of Pergamon. There we go. Galen of Pergamon. And he has he has a list of of exercises that basically cover all of the things that we're that we're kind of doing as part of this broader um, physical training continuum of the nightly class up until the 16th and even into the 17th century. Um, and he divides them in an interesting way and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to go back to the, the, the sort of framework using, using the framework of, of seven, you know, seven particular things as sort of like how we divide that. So whether or not we should use that number, I'm not going to debate. But what I will say is that it's, it, the framework limits itself, right? That by design, it limits itself. And, and so I don't know that we should be looking at a number seven, uh, seven things that we should do and say, okay, we're covering all of our bases, right? We've like, we've gotten to the core essential aspects of training that we need to focus on. They picked, they picked that number and they picked those particular activities uh, for very cultural reasons. And so it may or may not be useful for us to think about like whether or not everything on that list or, um, or everything like other, other than what's on that list is what we should be focusing on, how we should be recreating nightly training. Um, and there's another thing that I want to touch on briefly before we go into some more detailed stuff, which is the idea of mindset, right? Um, one of the things that we do as sort of post-enlightenment Americans is we have this obsession with or I'm not even gonna say we, I'm gonna say I, right? Have an obsession with a sort of puritanism, with a sort of everything that I'm doing has to get me closer to this ultimate state of being, right? Um, and that every way that I frame all of my various activities have to make me better, right? At some ultimate state of being or, 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 or help me approach or get closer to this ultimate state of being. So what do I mean by that? So when I, when someone asks me, what do I do? Right. I say, I fence. Right. And they say, well, that's kind of silly. You're, you know, you're, you're sword fighting. Like, and I'm like, yeah, but really what I'm doing is it's a martial art. Right. I'm making myself better as a man because I want to be, you know, a martial art and there's a sort of ideal of what, what it means to be a martial art or beyond that, there's an idea of what it means to be a man or a human. Uh, sorry for gendering this. It's really, really hard not to gender this kind of thing in American society in the 21st century, like to talk about why I would want to embody like a martial essential kind of thing. But, uh, you know, I can never just say, no, I do it for fun. Right? I just do it. I just do it because I enjoy it. Like it always has to be leading me towards this sort of um, this sort of goal of reaching this sort of ultimate essence of being. Um, and I'm not sure that is the. I I'm not sure that's the most useful framework either. And so, and I definitely don't think that we ought to project that mindset. Which, which could very well be a 21st century cultural phenomenon, particular to, um, particular to the, the way that you know, our culture is developed. Uh, uh, Jess Finley calls it a, um, a, a pervasive combination of puritanism and machismo, American machismo, right? That is like, it, 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 it compels us to, to couch everything that we do as sort of some way of developing ourselves to reach this, this, this essential state of being. I don't think that using that framework to project on these activities that the um, people were doing in the medieval and Renaissance period is the healthiest way of, of viewing those activities. Because it's not clear to me that someone who was concerned with 
um, with leaping or stone throwing in the 15th century was concerned with a sort of uh, you know personal development as a as a as a uh, you know uh, as a thing that involves sacrifice and dedication and hard work and like so that we can reach God as manifest through like you know personal uh, whatever. So yeah, so I I, I want to be clear about that that what I the, the approach that I've taken to these exercises since then has been just looking at what the exercises are specifically and then looking at a modern sort of sports science framework, right? A modern sort of uh, what is happening? What are we developing physiologically, psychologically through engagement with these activities, right? Um, and you know whether or not it works for us, or whether or not it helps us reach this essential. That's on you. You you do you. Uh, and if that means that that you you know this is your this is the way that you're approaching this, great. But but for me, I just kind of want to get a better sense of what's going on here and why these things might be might be useful. Uh, why these things why these things might have been useful to to them historically, and why they might be useful to me today, given my own particular uh, interests uh, and, and what it is about myself that I wanna develop or whether or not I just wanna have fun, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, that's what we're gonna talk about at this point from here on out, right? Um, I hope I've given you some resources with regards to where you can find these lists of activities, um, but let's look at them more specifically. But um, before we move on, I think Charles had a oh, little tidbit. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I was I was wondering if there, there's an alternative theory for um, how they might look back on these activities. Um, you know, certainly there's the, the modern puritanical one, which is like everything I do must make me a better being, right? right. And I, I have another frame that I also see is that um, the activities I pursue express qualities about me that I am trying to, to, to show. And so in the modern context, HEMA is, and fencing is valuable for that, right? Like, so, you know, if we just step back, people fence HEMA, or they say they fight with swords, or they fight with swords because they think it says something about who they are to people today. And I think what's interesting is that you can take that same mindset. And just as a quick anecdote, like when I'm looking at weighted marching, Sources from the 15th century are, are quoting Roman sources, they and are. right, and and so the the one possibility is that instead of exporting the, the the Puritan mindset, we we think about this social expression, right, and that it's important to them that they appear like soldiers. And what does it mean at that time? It's not necessarily kind of an objective consideration of like what are my weapons and what, what does the battlefield look like today? It's no, it's like, who were the manliest, most macho people of the 15th century? Well, for sure it's Romans, right? Like they were the most badass dudes around. Let's go cosplay Romans. And like, I, I think, um, I'm not saying that that's, that determines it, but it's certainly like a, a, um, a fresh angle, I think that one could take. I think, I think that's probably the most important, the, the most important part of that is that I, I want to really, really encourage lots of different experimentation with regards to how we frame what we're doing and how, how we, you know, sort of conceive of how they may have framed what they were doing. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I, I'm ever going to have a, a, a good answer. I don't yeah. know that I'm ever going to be able to discover the truth of that. So, you know, you, you know, and as yeah. much as you can discover the truth in anything, I don't yeah. know that. So I don't think it's useful to try. Um, but I definitely might think about ways that it may have manifested and, and see if that helps inform anything about the sources for me or, or, or maybe anything about the way that I might approach the world. One other angle that I, I like to take and I tend to take is just that often these expressions were a, um, communing with God, right? And so like taking part in the activity, uh, it wasn't sort of this, you know, it was sort of like, it's a way of getting me better, although they were totally interested in progress. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to suggest that they were devoid of like, uh, of, of a desire to improve, right? They were like, we, we know that Seneca um, says, Seneca says, 
you know, you want to make these things easier. You want to make, no, make them easy by practice, right? You want to make it so that you don't even notice that you're doing these things um, by practice. They, you know, they're interested in getting better, but that Seneca and the, and the 200s, maybe in the 1200s and the 1500s, people are looking at these activities as a, as a way of sort of, you know, meditating or, or, or kind of, um, uh, communing with God, right? Uh, I, I don't know. That's, that, that's an angle that I, that I like to take. I think, uh, I think it's really, really important that we remember, um, that spirituality, Christian spirituality in particular, plays a huge role in the lives of all of these people. Uh, and so it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to say for sure. But anyway, I, I totally agree that we need to be looking at, we, you know, the primary goal should be coming up with fresh new ways of thinking about how, how these, um, these people approached what they were doing and conceived of what they were doing in the broader picture of their lives. Um, okay, so now let's talk about, all right, let's switch gears here. And this is going to be more interesting to maybe some of you. Um, it's certainly very, very important for me. I'm going to talk about modern sports science, right? Uh, ways that we as, um, as people who are concerned with training for martial arts want to or ought to think about the sort of the tried and true methods for, for thinking about our own training that makes us better fighters, right? Um, and then we're going to circle back to the activities that the um, people historically were engaging in and see whether or not they're fitting any of those bills. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, uh, and I'll, I'll ask you guys, what do you think the foundation of martial, um, of martial ability comes from? In terms, of, if we're going to break it down in various categories, and it could be any category, so don't, don't be intimidated by the question, but what would you regard as the foundation? I might pick two for this, uh, but what would you regard as the foundation for your martial abilities? You say physical abilities proprioception and you mean timing. Like, okay, pro proprioception and timing. Those are good. I'm gonna write those down. Do you mean like personally or just in general? Personally. Being generally bigger than the other person helps a lot. <laughs> okay, so being, so, <laughs> well, but there's a reason, there's a reason for that. Um, and if we could kind of uh, distill, distill sort of the reason out of that a little bit. What is, what are some of the advantages? What's one particular advantage that you have over someone who's much, much smaller than you? Reach. Uh, so I can control the measure and the temp. Okay. Good. I'm fighting. Good. How about, I was going to say strength. Let's look at strength. Yes, that's the second one, I guess. <laughs> All right. And, and, and I would throw in leverage too, as, like with the height variation, that's more of a leverage game. Sure, yeah. Also, you can't lose if you have the high ground. Ha ha ha, got it. <laughs> oh, if well he goes played. high, you shame him below. <laughs> All right, so okay, we're, so we're gonna say strength, we're gonna say proprioception, timing is great. Uh, what else? Um, so here's something, uh, so we think about strength. What's sort of another way that strength is manifest? What's sort of like, we can kind of think of a, a, a derivative of strength. Endurance. Mm, I'm not gonna group that, just from a sports science perspective, I'm not gonna group that in, uh, in the strength category, although I can see why you, you would make that connection. How about power? Are you looking for like recovery or explosiveness? Explosiveness is what I'm looking for, right? Uh, not recovery yet. We'll talk about recovery. So explosiveness. Okay. And we're going to call explosiveness power. And we're going to go into a little bit about what explosiveness really is, what's happening in our bodies with regards to explosiveness. So we've got strength. We've got explosiveness. No one said... Flexibility, uh, maybe? Flexibility is great. I was going to suggest uh, grappling and, and just springiness. Spring the agility. To close distance quickly in order to control the fight quickly. Yeah, I think, I think, that's, I think that's really important. I think that we're gonna, we're gonna call that explosiveness, right? Really, let's talk about what these things are more specifically, okay? So we've, we begin with strength. Um, strength, we're gonna call the ability to lift 
heavy shit, right? So that's what strength is. Strength <laughs> is going to be the ability to move heavy loads, right? Now, there are various ways that we can do that. We can, we can move heavy loads uh, more slowly, uh, or we can move heavy loads more quickly, right? Uh, do you think... Do you think it's easier to move a heavy load more quickly or slowly? How many times are you doing it? It's just you're, you're doing it once. So let's say I put a barbell on your back and you've got a squat. Uh, you know, could you, is it easier to move that? Let's say you start with any given weight and you have five seconds to move it or you have two seconds to move it, what, you're, what are you gonna have an easier time doing? Probably the five, just for the sake of balancing. Well, just, just because that's like, you can just think about it. It's a, it's a thought experiment, right? Like you put yourself under a bar, you say, all right, push this up as fast as you can. And if I put a time limit on it, there is some time limit, right? Where whatever it is that you're not gonna be able to do it in, right? Um, just, just as a thought experiment, it, it, that's an easy sort of, um, thing to conceive of, right? So what, what power and explosiveness is, is the ability to, to recruit as much strength as you have as fast as you can, right? Uh, what no one said, what no one has said yet is speed, right? So we've got speed, we got strength. Is that one you were going to say, Joe? Did someone yes. some else have that? Shoot. Who, who had it? Was it Joe? Joe. Of course, Joe. Okay. And then we missed John, too. Unfortunately, I didn't see his little hand raised on the screen because I was looking at the sidebar, not the main screen. So John uh, might have had speed, too. Gotcha. Anyone else think of any other? So uh, uh, speed, strength. We got flexibility, proprioception. Time. Would you lump that in with balance? Well, so, yeah. What I would do is I would think of, like, those um those areas i'm going to call coordination right so we've got coordination we've got speed we've got power and then someone else said endurance right so endurance is manifest in two different ways um you, you and you guys can just think about raise your hand if you've run before like as a hobby or just because you oh, have as a hobby well or just because you had to right so, because I had to, let's right, be real. Right. <laughs> so running is horrible. Everyone agrees with that. <laughs> right. Um, but so there is a, there's a pace. Think about, think in your head, uh, think about that pace that you can run, right? For as long as you need to run, right? That might, you know, everyone's going to have a different pace. For some of us, like me, that's going to be a very slow pace. Maybe some people here who've got a lot of training and running, can do, can do that much faster than I can, right? But it's the pace at which you can maintain that pace for as long as you have like energy in your body, right? As long as you've had sufficient food stores. Does that make sense? Right, the marathon pace as it were, right? And then you have a different pace. So now thought experiment, think about running as fast as you can, right? You're just going all out. You're giving a hundred percent and think about what that's like. And then think about how long you can keep that up. Right? So we have two different types of endurance. Um, they're sort of analogous to the two different types of strength that we talked about. Right? So you have strength, just moving heavy stuff. Then you got power, which is recruiting your strength as fast as you can. Then you've got sprinting. Uh, which is, you know, or rather I'll start with not sprinting, um, you know, running, you know, running at a, a, we won't say leisurely pace, but we'll call it running below your lactic threshold, right? Running at a pace that you generate lactic acid at such a rate that your body's able to metabolize it rather than become saturated in it, right? That's, we'll call that a marathon pace, right? And then we have sort of your all-out sprint. And everyone who's ever all-out sprinted knows 
that there's an amount of time that you can do that for, and then you throw up. And then you throw up. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Right? And, th and that's way different than like the marathon pace. First of all, it's way faster. Second of all, the compulsion to throw up is way greater. Okay. We have, sorry, two, two hands up. So John and uh, Tien, I feel so bad. I know your face, but I forgot your name. Go for it. John, I think you're, you're on. The microphone in front of face. Let me, uh, let me use my gear right. Um, another broad category I'd like to offer is mental control. Uh, everything you're describing is important, but if you lack the mental control to uh, know exactly what you can do and also have the capacity to calm your own nerves, to uh, muster your experience, bring that experience and your tactics to the bear, then you're just a mindless brute that is running around with great, I'm glad you're strong and all that, glad you, you got, but you could just be the victim of your own adrenaline. You can make errors. So if you cannot control that, uh, you're at a loss. And going back to you're just talking about runners, runners don't just have great cardio and leg strength. They also have a very fine tuned understanding of uh, how they need to maintain their stride, what pace they need to maintain, uh, given the distance they're trying to cover and what their goal is, uh, as an example. And I look at some of the top end folks in this sport, you know, the McKinsey's of the world, and I, I see more than just physical prowess. I see a very keen intellect that has utter utmost control of their actions. And what I really think about is I think about Eastern martial arts, the meditative aspect of those where you control your everything you're doing uh, with your mind more than you control it with your own body or your you know, your perceptors and all that. So I just want to add the one in there. A little wordy, but my, my summary, though, is uh, your, your capacity to use your, your mental faculties to bring everything you're describing to bear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we could really just we could just break down all how all of all of the areas that we've already spoken of, like even beyond just like, and also having a bunch of skills that are relative to the activity, but like even just having strength is a skill, right? Um, so there's, there's intellectual control, right? And then there's also the sort of a, a subconscious control of just being able to relax. Um, you know, timing in a sense, timing is a form of that, right? Proprioception is a form of a very, very fine-tuned um, honing of our, of our mental precision, right? Of our psychological precision. Uh, so, so yeah, no, I, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, but then also, you know, beyond, beyond that sort of subconscious, being able to intellectualize what we're doing and being able to, uh, uh, ha you know, being able to have a complex framework that we can work within. Um, to be able to make use of all of these things, right? So yeah, I absolutely, I uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, one other hand up, was there, Mar Marlon? Ted, yeah, Ted. Ted? Sorry, no, um, you know, this thing, the entire thing with mute, you start talking and you realize mute's on. Um, I guess I also uh, offered it in chat is aggression, or at least the uh, the willingness to engage. Sure. And and you have all this physical aspects, but what about the mental? Yeah, I I think I think you're right that um, that sort of uh, a willingness to engage falls under a, uh, falls under sort of the broader category that John brought up, which is just like an acumen and not just not just a physical acumen where you've you know you've trained your muscle memory to be able to respond in certain ways but like a mental fortitude like i'm going to do these things for whatever reason i might not be able to it might not be because i've i don't have a complex framework enough to do it it might be because i'm just scared right it might be because i i haven't learned to relax right um there are so many there's so, yeah yeah <laughs> There are so many um, ways that just sort of not having a robust enough framework, intellectual framework, might lead to, to not being able to use 
these various other skills. I, th I think it is important to, to remember that you talk about moving heavy weight, right? You can't learn to squat 300, 400 pounds by just doing it over and over. I mean, you can get better, right? But what you really need is someone to coach you, right? Like, hopefully everyone here has at least in some, at some point in their life done a squatting exercise beyond like, hey, squat. Like, someone's done it and done it wrong and had someone tell them, no, this is the way you do it, right? If you do it under a barbell, you learn very quick. Like, there are things that you need. Yes, that's why, Brent, you're right. Squats are the best. I will always defer to squats. We'll always come back to squats. Everyone should be doing squats. I don't know why you're not squatting right now. All of you right now should be squatting, right? Um, so, but like, so you've got to learn, like, hey, you got to push your knees out. You know, you got to brace your core. You've got to learn that. That's a mental skill. We forget. We think, oh, strength is just your muscle's ability to move X amount of pounds. No, those amount of pounds that you can move is directly related to the intellectual effort that you've put into that, right? And that's true about all of these things. You, you squatted 289 times, geez, geez. That's a lot, that's a lot, that's a large number. Um, okay, so, all right, so talking about, talking about all these things, right? How, what are some of the ways that we can learn to develop these things? And what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna give you a sort of uh, a, a very um, a highly effective way of approaching, the develop, of approaching development in these areas, right? And we'll begin with strength, because strength is foundational. You'll never be able to, um, you'll never be able to, we'll say, do an Olympic, an Olympic weight, um, sort of Olympic weight lift, right? So a snatch or a clean or something that you have to explode out of the hole with, right? You're never going to be able to do that with a weight that you can't just lift, right? Um, so you can imagine you're not going to be able to heavy or to hang clean or power clean a weight that you can't deadlift, right? Strength is foundational. And how do you do strength? Well, the way that you do strength is by lifting heavy things, by doing strength specific training. And that comes from not focusing so much about how fast you can do it, but by focusing how much you can lift. And we have a whole system in the 21st century that's dedicated to that. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer you that as martial artists, what we really ought to be focusing on are the lifts, uh, are the lifts among sort of the, the, the um, continuum of lifts that are, are most similar to the types of postures and that use the type of muscle groups that we use in fencing, right? So everyone's already heard me say that squats are the best. Squats are the best. So everyone should be doing their squats. Deadlifts also count for a lot. Um, what else? Deadlifts, squats, bench. Rows. Rows, bench. overhead press. Right, the compound yep. lifts, right? The standing mm -hmm. compound lifts. Why do we choose compound lifts? Because you can move the most weight, right? If we're concerned with strength training, strength as such, we're concerned with learning, training our body to move the most, the most amount of pounds, then we're gonna wanna do the exercises that are going to allow us to move the most amount of pounds. So you should all throw bicep curls out of your, I mean, unless you're looking to be a bodybuilder, that's a different sport. Right, um, but uh, you know, I I personally focus on on heavy on on heavy strength training, but then when it comes to power, what are what is power, right? So power is recruiting all of those strength muscles as fast as we can, explosively, right? That's uh, um, what are some exercises that we might look at, or what are some modern approaches to developing power in ourselves? And why might we be concerned with power? From the perspective of a fencer, why would you be concerned with power? Someone already said, closing distance rapidly, right? Hugely important. What else, anyone else? Hands? Throwing a successful parry. Just, all right, just getting your, yeah, getting your sword in place as fast as you can. 
right? That's, that's going to involve power, right? What else? Recovery. Uh, your recovery from measure. You're saying like, to, yeah, to measure, go. misstep, sloppy parry, whatever. Yeah, just to, just to, in order to move in order to move super super quickly and explosively for you know various tactical reasons, right? Uh, what else? We're we're very concerned. At least we were for like the last ten years about this area of fencing that was kind of ignored for maybe the prior ten years. And Mike Edelson made it a point to make it like the most important thing in the world. Cutting. Cutting, right? You know, we, we got to demonstrate, like, so cutting te requires technique, it requires finesse, it requires good edge alignment, but also it requires rapid recruitment of our, you know, of our core muscles. Does that make sense? I would argue pulling bro blows too, like knowing, sure. knowing the level of generation needed. Sure. Yeah. 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 And exactly. You can't control something that you can't do. Right. So you have to be able to do it. You have to have lots and lots of, uh, of experience. You know, this gets back to like, not just intellectualizing it, but making it a part of your muscle memory, make it a part of um, the way that your body works. You have to have that experience of doing a thing a thousand times in order to have total control over it. So yeah, I would argue that too. I think that's a super good insight. All right, let's talk about, so we've got um, speed, strength, we've got endurance. The, so this is interesting. We, uh, as, as fencers in the, you know, in the 21st century, we've developed an interesting model for competitive fencing, right? And what kind of role does that play for us? What's, this, what's the standard sort of uh, sequence look like? in competitive fencing, if we're thinking about in terms of endurance. Come on, oh, with the three minute time limit or? Okay, so there's a, there's a time limit, right? But that's just what the timer's doing, right? But how often Changes. do, how often do matches that. take? Okay. Bursts, it's uh, quick exchanges that are, yeah, over quickly. Yeah, so quick exchanges, super explosive. Um, what about in terms of recovery? Like what's the length of time before the next exchange? It could be forever. A couple seconds. Yeah. Could, uh, sometimes it could be a couple seconds, depending on the tournament. Sometimes it could be like, oh my God, are these, can these judges figure this out? I don't even care. It just, I just want to fence again, right? That's true. All, but even like in non-scoring actions, there's roughly a five second delay before they enter back in typically whether it's like a resizing and like a strategy shift. Right, all of that, all of that plays a role, right? So, you know, when we're looking at what type of endurance that we need to develop, sort of a long, you know, do we need to develop a long-term endurance, right? Where we have a super high lactic threshold um, or do we ever reach that lactic threshold? Because our exchanges are only 15 seconds long. Most of that is, <clears throat> is exceedingly passive right? And when the, you know, when the big explosion happens, it happens for less than five seconds, and then we get to take a break for upwards of a minute afterward, right? So, I mean, we've developed a, a particular model that requires a particular type of endurance, right? Maybe we should look critically, historically, at what type of activities they were doing and for what length of time to see if they were <clears throat> concerned, um, with a, a longer a longer term endurance, right? Um, and I think there's uh, there's insights that we can get from the factual insights that we can get from wrestling. Now, you know, wrestling is huge huge part of the historical physical training continuum. Uh, probably we also just changed how we're scoring um, and how we're even repping those bouts because of the endurance question. Well, so so you're you're saying that you, you guys may be in capital uh, KDF or well, like East coast, like with the historical ring and league that we did this winter, we messed with it. So um, I think even at clash last year, we had the continuous clock um, to avoid the stop and start, stop and start that you would see uh, with a, a sword bout. We really wanted to test the endurance aspect of the wrestlers to see how it changed the techniques and the, speed at which people were entering um, right. 
Right. So I think I, it significantly changed wrestling. Like overall, the matches look completely different year to year. Yeah. And I don't think it's just because people have been training. <laughs> I want to think, I want to, I want to talk about that. Um, so there's a difference when we, when we say like, there are some people who could run a marathon, right? Uh, but the, but among those people who can run a marathon, there are some of those people who couldn't sprint 10 times in a row for greater than, you know, let's say we, they couldn't sprint um, 10, 200 meter dashes, right? They're just people who are not physically able of doing that. They can run a marathon, 26 miles, but they can't sprint uh, just 200 yards 10 times in a row, 10 times 200, 2,000 yards, a mile, right? It's the or fast twitch, slow twitch, twitch, right? Uh, it's the, it's, it actually has more to do with the accumulation of lactic acid in your body and your ability to recover from it, yeah. right? So the, the people that are running marathons are never... Uh, never getting a point, never getting to a point where their body's producing more lactic acid than it can metabolize. So it's never demanding their body to work in the, in the a lactic output, uh, or, and it's never demanding the body to recover from, uh, from lactic saturation. Right. So, um, it's an, it's a skill. It's, it's also a skill to train explosive explosively and extreme at 100% output so that you basically can't do anything after that over and over and over again in a training exercise to try and improve that recovery time right but then also uh there's the ability to continuously perform at 100% output right so it's not just to be able to recover from lactic saturation but it's also working in that range of lactic saturation do I have the, the ability to, you know, push super, super hard, right? What does my sprint time look like when I get into those, you know, 30, 40, 50 seconds? Does my pace slow down dramatically? You know, uh, does it look different? And so I think that's, I think that's interesting. Um, and I want to, and I ask myself the question, how were historical people, how were the medieval people and Renaissance people that we're looking at approach these questions? Okay. Steve had an interesting insight in regards to Montante in chat. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not good at this. No, you're good. That's why I'm here. <laughs> good. You wanna um, that? Yeah, Steve, take it away, I guess. Oh God, you want me to talk? Sure. Um, I was just pointing out that um, not all historic martial arts are about, um, not all forms are about explosive or like single combat kind of things. Um, it's, it's worth noting that like for, in the extreme case, Montante, where you are training to fight indefinitely or until your arms fall off, um, unless you are relieved. Um, and in a battlefield context where you might have fight after fight after fight after fight after fight, um, until you are relieved. Murder copter. And I, I think I chased off our uh, our guest. Oh no. Serious. <laughs> I think he was embarrassed by your brilliance. <laughs> All good? I just, yeah, I my uh, the computer that I was using shit the bed without letting me know at all that it was about to. And so now I'm just on my phone, but luckily this didn't work out too poorly. So here we go. All right, I did hear uh, a lot of stuff that I agreed with. Um, that's gonna get to the question of coordination, right? And I was saying co within coordination, there are lots of skills, skills like flexibility, timing, um, mobility, right? Mobility and flexibility are different. Um, proprioception, Right. Uh, so there, you know, there's sort of martial techniques, forms, systems that relate to the development of endurance, such as we were talking about, um, but also just exercises that relate to those, the development of those areas. But then there are also 
martial forms, martial, uh, where is the, yeah, there are also martial arts that relate to the development of coordination, of movement, of mobility, of being able to systematically move your body in a technically correct way, right? Um, and, you know, if we, if we look at running, we say, okay, uh, you know, you're really skilled because you can run super fast, you can run a marathon, but maybe that's the only way you can move your body. Maybe you've never really developed how to move, you know, martially, such as, you know, such as it is, right? And so when we, so when I look at the historical training continuum, right, what I'm really asking myself is I look at each of the areas that peop, that historical people were driven to excel in, and I ask, how does that relate to my modern sports science and conception of the world? What area does that help develop, right? And does it do a good job of that? Maybe that's the way, maybe that's the way that I ought to be thinking about these training continua rather than trying to project culturally or even just trying to hypothesize culturally what the hell is going on, how they conceive of what they're doing. Uh, and that's sort of where I'm at right now in, in this process. And I want to talk about Go ahead. Someone just opened their, John? No, sorry, I'm just coming to my phone and I got some feedback, sorry. I'm just jumping my he phone. Was switching devices. Me. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I switch. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's look at let's look at these areas, right? So, what were the areas? We have. Uh, we have stone throwing. So, what is stone throwing? What's the primary use of stone throwing in a modern training continuum for martial artists or for any athlete? Anyone know? New question. How many people participated in Charles uh, Knightley physical training he did last year? How many people got to actually throw stones? Okay, a few of us. Cool. Anyone, does anyone have any idea, like in terms of our list, how stone throwing can be integrated into a you know, development of a Oh, someone didn't throw it very far. That's funny. Um, uh, of a, of a well-rounded martial artist. I will tell you that I was really surprised to discover that stone throwing up until this day remains probably the foremost method of developing power in a striking martial artist, but also in wrestlers and grapplers and uh, fighters of various forms, uh, et cetera, et cetera, including fencers. Right, it's, it manifests in the med ball toss, various med ball slams, overhead toss, um, uh, uh, along with that, we have stuff like banded chops um, and other, other things that are gonna require us to explode. And, you know, if we think about why we, why we would use a stone to do that, versus what a uh, heavy weight it's pretty obvious right i mean if let's say you explode a heavy weight up off your chest then that heavy weight has to come back down and whether or not you're able to catch it can be pretty dangerous right if you generate as much force and power explosive power you, know, you recruit as much of your uh, uh, of your strength as possible and exert it all in a single motion into a stone and you throw that stone against a wall or whatever, you're able to recruit as much as you can possibly, right? And the, you know, it's not a very dangerous exercise. You can channel that force into a brick wall. If it's a light enough medicine ball, it's not gonna do any harm to anything, right? Yeah, the the, other it was funny with the stones cause it ended up, and it could just be that we were bored and did things we weren't supposed to, but we also messed with, um, different grips on the stone as far as throwing it, finding the best balance point. Um, we were doing actual like presses and like passing of the stones to, well, like so there were multiple behaviors we were messing with. They, yeah, so they did, they did those too. Uh, you know, stones have been, historically stones have been like 
the go-to for exercise, just like as far back as we can tell um, in terms of Galen of uh, Pergamon, as I mentioned already, like they, they lifted stones, they passed stones, they walked with stones, they tried to hold stones out in front of them, they tried to have other people try and rip the stones out of their hands. Like, I mean, stones are just a really easy thing. You can do a lot of strength training with stones. I mean, also stones are very, very heavy for as compact as they are, right? There's very few things that are as dense in terms of weight. Um, but then also if they're light enough, you can throw them. And that is a way of developing power. And the other uh, method, when you look at it from a sports science pers perspective, and by this, I mean, like if you went online right now and you typed in, how do I, learn to generate as much power as possible you just googled that it's going to tell you all of those things i just said all of those med ball tosses and what's the other thing it's going to tell you anyone guess leaping 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 is the primary mechanism for power development and has been uh so far as i can tell throughout history right? But certainly today, uh, plyos, right? So box jumps, weighted squats or jump squats, uh, weighted jump squats, uh, reflex jumps, jumps for distance, jumps for height. Uh, even the Olympic lifts, if you look at hand cleans, power cleans, and snatches, and the, the, you know, the types of lifts where you have to take the barbell off the ground and throw it up on your shoulders, that's a jumping action. Right. So so it's not a surprise to me that those two particular areas were of heavy focus in the medieval training continuum because they were highly concerned with power. <laughs> right. Um, now, there's another thing that comes up very often in the medieval training continuum. We've talked about endurance. Uh, I, I don't know if we went into details, but they were certainly running quite a bit. Uh, but they were also wrestling and they were doing wrestling of various forms. Um, you know, the, the game, the wrestling games that they would play were interesting. They did games that involved balance, right? We, we were, we're very familiar with the hack and, uh, or the, the, um, I can't remember the hole, the guy who's standing in the hole. Yeah. Wrestling in the hole. What is it called? I don't called? know the German for it. I don't know. We just call it wrestling in the hole. Yeah. Mirror. Uh, if only Tim were here. Yeah. What is it? Did you say guy in a hole? I think it's the, the marital duel. <laughs> yeah, group line or something like that. Marital <laughs> duel. Um, well, so any, yeah, there's, that's a little different. Um, but, that's the guy in the uh, pit. Yeah. The, uh, but then there's the, there, there's the other game that comes up an, an awful lot. It's foot wrestling. And we don't really know what that is, but there's lots of pictures of it. Um, and very, at various uh, encampments or... Um, if you look at the uh, Planet Kinder uh, drawings that were sort of popular in the 14th and 15th century, um, the, you know, basically all of these areas where training was being conducted, you often see two wrestlers and, and both of them, one of them, one of them is sitting, the other is standing, and both have their feet up against the soles of their feet, one of their feet up against each other. And there's some form of wrestling that's like pervasive throughout Europe in the 14th and 15th and 16th century um, that involves this game. We don't know what the rules are uh, for, for this game, but it's really interesting. They're looking at balance specifically with that type of game. With wrestling, right, now we're looking at, uh, with, with sort of the wrestling that we're more familiar with, looking at the development of not only purely wrestling skills, but also the development of our long-term endurance, right? but also a repeated sprint ability. Anyone who's ever wrestled knows that there are explosive bursts where you have to go 100%. And then there are moments when you've structured yourself in such a way where you're kind of safe to relax and try and recover some of that so that you're able to do it again. And the ability to do that over and over and over again throughout a three minute match or whatever, right? Is, is something that they were obviously concerned with. They were also concerned with running. They were also concerned with running long distances and concerned with running short distances very fast, right? So they're concerned with the, the state of their lactic threshold. 
the output that they can achieve without pushing themselves over the limit, right? Whatever 60% output is and making that number higher and higher and higher all the time. But then also concerned with what it looks like to have 100% output, right? Through the various running exercises they were doing. So, <clears throat> so, so then the question is, where does coordination come in, right? And I think personally, that's the role that's gonna be played by the, um, by two areas that we haven't really talked about too much yet. Uh, one is fencing, that's obvious, right? So there's a, there's a technical coordination that we're learning by using, uh, learning to use a sword. But before that, I wonder about dance, all right? So dance is on this list. It's, it belongs as one of the seven probates. So in, or, in the medieval mind, for whatever reason, they considered for you to be, uh, you know, sort of the embodiment of a martial um, person in that culture during that time period, you had to have skill, you, have to, you had to have power, you had to have speed, you had to have endurance, and you also had to have skill in dance, right? Do you, we know what kind of dance thing they were doing? Does it specify? Uh, we we don't. Um, what I can say is like stuff like I mean we know we we know about folk traditions. Uh huh. Um, one of the uh, and by folk traditions I mean like Lithuanian folk traditions or Irish yep. for for that matter folk traditions. Dude, oh, Irish is so good for sprinting. I I did Irish step dancing for like four and a half years. If you want to get good vertical, you got to do Irish step dancing. So there's that, right? But also it's great for your hips and it's great for oh. your toes. Oh, okay. So maybe historically it used to be, but I would argue the way they do it now, it's, it's harder on the body than you think because it's all done on the toes. So like a normal, like in ballet, feel free to like tell me to shut up. Um, yeah, the dancing's it. like my niche. Dancing's my niche. I did, um, years I, i've been dancing since i was like 11 so um ballet they train you to do a jump by going heel ball toe and then landing toe ball heel irish they don't want in competitions at least modern day competitions they don't want your heels to come down at all so it's like you're jumping rope the whole time yeah um which i would argue is harder on your feet ankles <clears throat> knees and hips and then you also have this forced turnout and over crossing that is happening um mm -hmm. And I'll just use my hands because you're not gonna be able to see it if I do it by my feet. So like a normal ballet fifth position is like here, right? So we have like, if these are my feet and these are my heels, the butt of my hands are my heels. Fifth position is at the joint of the big toe. Irish step dancing, they want you to overcross it. So you're toe to toe. And then uh -huh. you're up on your toes the whole time. And nobody has that kind of turnout to like hold it. So there's like this stress because you end up turning out from your knees, which is like weakening your ACL, you know, everything like your knees are just shot if you do this for sure. too long. And then you well, have the stress that's happening on the lower back too from the constant impact. Sure. Uh, so I, I would argue that there's probably some artifacts and in, 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 in modern um, iterations of this, especially ones where yeah. there's a competitive sort of uh, environment where people are, are learning to do this kind of thing. But I would also say that if you look at Irish dancing, you say, okay, how do you teach someone to, to move with their toes first as opposed to with their heels, right? One way that you can do it is you say, be on your toes all the time, right? Uh, I would also say that in most, uh, most martial arts, mo most popular martial arts today, we'll, we'll just say, the stuff, the competitive stuff, title match, competition, boxing, MMA, they want you on your toes. MMA coaches will say today, be on your toes. Boxing coaches will say, be on your toes. Because being on your toes allows you to absorb the force of moving in and out of uh, measure. And when I say absorb, I don't mean like from the perspective of long-term uh, sort of uh, 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 sustainability. I mean, like within the moment, you're able to absorb the force of moving in and out, and that's going to be able to give you uh, some more uh, advantage in terms of movement, right? Makes you a little also, faster, too, because you don't have that body shift, right? So if you're flat-footed, right. you have this body shift that has to happen as you hit your toe. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, you know, I think, I, I think it's interesting when you look at folk dance traditions, if we ask ourselves, what function was this serving for the people at the time? Why is dancing so closely related to martial arts forms? Another thing about dancing that I really, that I think is very interesting is that when you teach someone to dance, uh, what you're teaching, what you're teaching them to do is pretty arbitrary, right? So it's, it's totally decontextualized, right? You're saying, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to do this crazy thing with your heels and your toes and you're out like this. And then the person says, well, why? Right? And you say, because, because that's your instep is hot and that's how you get a man. <laughs> that was that the context. That's that right. was the context. That's hilarious. That's why ballet has turned out as well. But honestly, it's, you also have more range of motion when your hip is turned out versus when it's not. Because the way your the, femur head sits in your hip joint. The, the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, if you say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to step with your toes. I want you to open up your hips. You give someone a sword and you say, I want you to do those things. And then now, okay, go fence, right? It totally decon it, it, it's, they're not interested in, in what you've asked them to do, right? Their primary function, their primary purpose is to do well in the fencing, right? And so what dancing does is it just gives them, it gives new students a way of systematically thinking about each of the parts of their body and moving them in coordination, right? Without giving them some other thing that they're supposed to be achieve, achieving in this process, right? Especially for young kids, that's a really, really effective way of training people to use their bodies, right? I, I mean, I think we all have some experience telling uh, telling a person, uh, telling a young uh, a young person to go out and wrestle, maybe fence, do something, and you say, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to turn your toe out. Like they're not interested in turn your toe out they just want to hit they always turn it in first it cracks of course me they up. Turn it, in. it like it never matters what you say they could be perfectly parallel and you're like turn your foot out and it's immediately <laughs> yeah it's so funny but if you start with a sort of uh you know if you start with teaching them how to dance not only do they learn how to use their bodies not only do they learn how to focus on what different parts of their bodies is doing they also learn how to move it in sequence right so if you think okay, when you're doing this dance step, the first thing you do is you do this with your leg. Then you do this with your other leg. Then you jump. Then you come back down, you know, step out this way. All of that is this complex, um, this complex series of movements, right, in a very specific order for no other purpose but to do this complex of series of movements in a very specific order, right? Uh, have, does anyone have experience with uh, martial artists who started as dancers? Or did, I mean, I know Marlene, you started as a dancer. Has anyone else come from a dance um, background? I, I've been dancing for like 10 years, so. How has, how has that helped or, or not helped your, your martial practice, Charles? Uh, I think you're spot on. It, like, I, the way I think of it is like handwriting exercises. You know, like I, I don't care what I'm writing, right? Uh, and, and also, I, I so just to be clear, I come from a very different background, which is like uh, kind of which is Lindy Hop, which is like jazz vernacular jazz. So the the, the ideas aren't pre as prescriptive about like what form you should take. Um, but I think you're spawned in the sense that the, the way I see dance, at least in this perspective, is do this stuff. You know, we we just want your handwriting to be good, right? And you don't care what you're writing. You you just want to get good at writing it. And that prepares you to write other things, right? And so, you know, if you need to change your letter forms, you can do that again. Um, so, yeah, there's that. I mean, there's all sorts of things that um, it makes it easier without having a sword in your hand, you know, to think about body movement, right? And if I, if there was a kid, I didn't trust with to hold a sword, right? Because, you know, or like to to train to hold a sword. Like maybe there's a kid I don't tr trust to have the ability to harm people. First, I would I would test their ability to do you know physical movements generally, and um, that also tests their ability to just sit still, listen, and learn. Um, a lot of the the didactic form of dance is is just training people to move, right? And when you translate it to fencing, it's just an, an additional complication, but it's not something that can't be worked around. Right. So yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really helpful. There's one other aspect of dance 
where I think is uh, relevant and useful to um, a martial application. And that's the question of rhythm, right? Um, now, when you tell someone what it means to kind of feel rhythmically or move rhythmically uh, in a martial context, you know, I'm, I often wonder what, you know, how someone who hasn't thought of it yet conceives of that idea. Like, should I, you know, is it because I want to be relaxed? Is that why I'm thinking rhythmically so that I can kind of dance and, and, and is that, but there's an, um, if we think about rhythm, if we think about the beat, right? So the beat of a, of a, of a music, of a, of a, of a piece of music. Uh, and also, you know, especially in the period, we're talking about very specific types of music. So it's not church music. It's not classical music. It's folk music. It's music with a beat, right? When you're teaching someone how beats work, right? Um, how to move a different time within the beat, right? So, you know, if we're talking about Irish dancing, you're doing this step and then the beat happens and you do this and then before the next beat you come up and so that you're landing on the beat, right? Uh, you know, whatever it is, sure, Marlene. It depends on the type of dance you're doing too. So within Irish step dance, um, you have a uh, real uh, light jig, slip jig, hornpipe, treble jig, and then you have your set dances. And the set dances are always to specific pieces of music. So like, yeah. I'm gonna say Blackbird because that's like the one that everybody knows or whatever. So it's, you do two and a half steps. Um, and that's like, that's been going on for ages, right? So right. that is, you're doing the Blackbird set dance and everyone does the Blackbird set dance. Like that's right. it. Or you do like a traditional four hand or two hand Kaylee, which is like the group dance, the partner stuff. And it's, it's the same thing. It's very traditional. But the timing of the music, so like the amount of beats that are in an eight count changes. So yeah. a reel is four, four, four. And like, feel, I don't know, people are going to check this and I'm misremembering because I haven't done it in a while. Reels are like four, four. So it's like one, two, three, four, you know, five, six, seven, eight, like normal. Sure, sure, sure. Slip jig is a, specifically slip jig is a female dance that they do and it's a waltz time. So it's one, one, two, three, two, 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 three. It's very yeah. cool very tiring <laughs> and then like hornpipes and treble jigs also have their own distinct um beat pattern well, within the music which i guess is just compounding what you're saying but well no but i think it's i think it's important so we have like the way that what are the way that our action um oh i'm i'm loving that comment from you gina, Dude, gina that also, is so cool i'm also loving the fact that you've done you did italian folk dance um but like so the way just if you just think about like putting your movement in a specific timing context Right, I think is like one of the main draw the main draws that I that I'm or main conclusions that I'm trying to draw from the you know the relevance to dancing to martial culture is like we have to move our body a certain way, but also there's a sequence in which we have to move it, and also there's a specific timing, right, that we need to be able to to perform our actions. So what, I mean, this should all be screaming at you guys at the top of your heads. You should all be saying like, Indes, 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 right? Like, that's what Indes is. Indes is, is this beat, right? It's not boom, 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 boom. If, if you did that, you'd never win a fencing battle, right? It's, he move, you move. He move, you move, right? And there's an ability to understand that rhythmically and develop that sense of rhythm that, I mean, it comes from dance, or at least it, it was certainly manifest in their dancing traditions at the time. Um, and if you look in some cultures, uh, you find that dance and play, or specifically like sword dance and sword play, are, are the same word, right? And so, uh, and, and so there's no distinction between people doing sword play versus doing sword dance um you know that really gets to the heart of the question for me with regards to what fencing is right if we go back to the the comment made about um the, uh, by steven about how there are some martial <clears throat> forms that are predominantly focused on movement 
as opposed to uh, a, um, a, a hyper-developed ability to explode or to just be super strong or to be super fast, right? Or to have lots of stamina. There's also this whole movement part of it. And there are lots of traditions, if we look at just like uh, Chinese traditions or Scottish broadsword dance, or, uh, um, you know, if we, if we look spe specifically at like Tai Chi. Right? Tai Chi is an example of a martial art where the sort of the martial effectiveness, right? If, if the only way that we're gonna conceive of martial effectiveness, effectiveness is its usefulness in a sparring context, right? You know, then we say, <clears throat> well, Tai Chi is not very martial. Right, because of course we do, because we just prescribe, it's, a, it's tautological at that point, right? But uh, if we say that what Tai Chi develops is a super sophisticated sense of how to use our bodies and how to sequence the, mo the, the motions of our bodies and how, to, and how to establish a rhythm and fit the actions within a, con a, a rhythmic context, then all of a sudden you can see the value in Tai Chi. You can see the value in various forms of dance. and you can start to ask yourself if maybe the fencing that people were doing at the time wasn't meant to be hyper-competitive. <clears throat> An interesting insight, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the lecture here. Uh, um, I, could, I could go, I could take this a lot of different directions and, and I'm, I'm sort of happy with the way that things kind of went, but I, I, do, wanna, um, I do wanna kind of leave, leave it on this note. I was talking with some, some people who do some military training um, specifically, like very, very well regarded martial artists who excel in, in combat sport, right? Various forms of combat sport, including our, you know, weapon combat sports are so like the Philippine, um, traditions and, but then also in jujitsu and things like that. And I, I, I was curious to what degree trained soldiers in, in, in our military engage in, in, in sport, you know, in martial arts for sport. And his answer was exactly the opposite of what I expected, right? They don't, right? So like you take a Navy SEAL, right? And you say, well, obviously that guy's got to be a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? He's got to be a, an excellent striker, an excellent boxer with lots of experience, right? Lots of gold medals or whatever. And the answer is no, they don't at all. I mean, some of them do, but it's not programmed, right? Why? That's what I asked. I was like, why? Why wouldn't it be programmed? Why wouldn't they want to train their, their soldiers to be the, the best, you know, martial artists that they could be? And his answer was pretty simple. So they cost too much money, right? It's dangerous. There you go, right. Right, modern army combatives. I'm yeah. I want to say that out loud, um, but the chat left my screen. Where is it? Uh, can someone with a chat, Marlene? Would you read that last comment? I got you, Craig. Do you want to just read your comment? I'll read it. Modern okay. army combatives are to stay alive long enough for your buddy to show up and shoot the enemy. Right. Right. Now that's particular to our context, right? We, we have guns and we have uh, very sophisticated communication tools. And, you know, we, we, we can't just project that onto historical soldiers. But I do think it's interesting that our modern soldiers are less concerned with integrating combat sport into their training regimen than we might expect them to be. And I wonder to what degree these combat sports that we see, like let's say wrestling and fencing, for example, um, were of a sort that it was that it was dangerous to participate in, right? Um, it, you know, if if what they were training to do, if what they were becoming experts in was the kind of thing that they engaged in, if they engaged in a on a regular basis, they were going to get hurt, then they probably wouldn't be as valuable as, as military men, right? I think, that is a, I think that's a, a pretty profound insight. And I think that might shed a little bit of light as to what fencing is, 
And what I would argue it, what I would argue fencing is likely is a way to develop lots of skills, namely the ones that we've kind of already chronicled, um, particularly movement, um, maybe adrenaline dump, maybe uh, tactics with regards to the use of a weapon. Um, but I think these skills that it's developing in us are skills that are applicable across a wide variety of contexts, including defending the town if need be, or engaging in a duel if need be, or serving in a militia, or serving on the battlefield. Um, but I think that I think that a, a sort of desire to regard these fencing systems as anything, anything but a, me, a method for de developing these other areas, um, you know, sort of pigeonholing it into a context is probably not the best way to think about it. Does anyone have any questions for me? John does for sure. He's been sitting on one for a minute. Go for it. Sorry, I'm trying to get the mute button. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Uh, so two broad things. Uh, first, I'm going to go to the dancing thing, and then I want to follow up with a question that I was sitting on from the beginning. But back to dancing. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff that backs up what you're saying about the importance of dance too. Uh, the sport, uh, the great book, uh, By the Sword by, I'm blanking on the author's name, but just an amazing book. And one of the main things that he teases out in this book is that back in the day, you danced and you did swords. And many of the dances of the day, particularly you know, the Renaissance era, were construed in a way that you would practice things that, um, you know, your movements would be conducive to things such as small sword rapier and you were essentially developing muscles and developing physical control that would be great for that you fast forward a bit to all the way up until i believe the 1930s uh probably going to the 1940s uh many olympic level fencers were also known for their ballet and marlene is the one gal i mentioned one of the very famous german fencer that uh, you know, did not want to fight for Hitler, but wanted to fight. Uh, she was also known as a very prolific ballerina in Germany, but she also went on to get several gold and silver medals, I think in the 1939 uh, Olympics. My question is, um, in your research, have you seen where this started to fall apart? And to put a point to it, uh, to what extent do modern fencers also do ballet? Uh, you know, how many dance, how many, how many fencing coaches are telling their students, hey, by the way, I think you ought to go do some kind of dance. And I say that because the only instructor I've met in this game outside of people like Charles and Christian Butner and uh, Marlene that bring dance into the dojo, uh, is um, Francesco Loda out of Italy. And every class I've taken with him, he brings tempo and rhythm into the fight. He doesn't teach dancing and fighting separately. He brings tempo and rhythm into the fight in an amazing way. And again, summarizing my question, uh, why is, when did this fall apart? When did the two divorce themselves and why? And should we look at bringing the two back together in you know, yeah. more than just the way that Charles and Marlene are done? I have a totally separate question, but I want to get that one out first. Okay. So let me, I'll just, I'll try and answer that as quickly as possible. So what I would say is um, everything, the way that we understand it, you know, or at least everything that I've been describing, talking about um, remains pretty constant. In a sense, it kind of remains constant today so a lot of the activities that i talk about are you know manifest in track and field that are practiced in high school wrestling is practiced in high school um so a lot of this stuff continues up until this day exactly but, exactly but but i'd also say that what um things do fall apart generally in 
and maybe because of the industrial revolution and a reconceptualizing of education and how um, and how we should think about optimizing and economizing uh, for efficiency the way that we deliver education um, and you know uh, a lot of sort of these what could be regarded as holistic approaches to personal development begin to take a backseat to more specified you know in, industrial sort of assembly line approaches uh, you teach you know you, whatever you pair your five basic pairs or whatever and then you teach your cross and your jab and how to stick a guy with a bayonet and then get him out of here so we can get the next guy in here. <clears throat> so could you make an argument that... I would also argue... That, I'm sorry, could you make an argument? Good. Yeah, good. Well, like from a fiscal aspect too, like because of this divide that's happened, fencing is extremely expensive. Martial arts can be extremely expensive. Dancing is super duper expensive. Like it was... Like we did semester base at the ballet school I was at and it was like $1,200 a semester. And that's just for classes. That's not even including the kit you need. And if you're doing point shoes or anything like that, they last you maybe three months like tops. And that's if you're going to class like once a week and only using them for an hour at a time. All right. Yeah. So, so in our modern context, we have, we have a lot of sort of our own cultural baggage that we bring that make it more, more difficult. I will say that one of my favorite anecdotes is about dance and his relationship to martial arts is there's a boxer named Vasily Lomachenko. Um, hopefully someone there has heard of him. He's oh, they, sort of, they describe him as the matrix, right? Vasily Lomachenko or the matrix. And he won, you know, he had an amateur career that was better than anyone in the history of amateur boxing. He had like 400, to, he had 400 wins and one loss. And like the one loss that he had, he went back and beat that guy twice. Right, and uh, he's a belt holder now, has almost undefeated record. Um, he got robbed of his only loss, whatever. His dad was his trainer. Uh, he's gonna go down in the history books as sort of like one of the most innovational and revolutionary trainers of boxing. His dad made him quit boxing. When he was eight years old, made him quit. No more boxing. Kid, you're not doing boxing anymore. You're gonna do a Lithuanian folk dance so that, you, so that you can be a better boxer. Now listen, I don't know. Right. Michael Flatley did the same thing, Irish dancing. He was right. a boxer and then quit to do the Irish step dancing to get better. And and he yeah, and he just happened to be really good at dancing and so he just he never boxed again or whatever, right? But the point is like there are people who recognize the relationship, right? It's not that it's been completely lost. And you know, I, I would say that, you know, should we make it more commonly part of the pedagogy? Sure. I mean, yeah, I do. I, I certainly want to teach. I want to. I want to include it more in my lessons. I haven't. Maybe I could do a better job with that. Um, but you know, I, I think. I think, as far as as far as, to your question, like, I think that it's incumbent upon anyone who sees the relevance to make a case for why we should integrate it into our martial training. I mean, it certainly was there, right? And it certainly has immediate, uh, describable. Um, uh, direct benefits, a right? direct application to what we're doing. And so, yeah, totally. Um, what was your other question? So let me, before I move on, let me dovetail back to something you said that is probably very good uh, and worth to explore. Uh, you talk about the impact of the industrial evolution and the way it changed pedagogy. Well, look at industrial warfare. And if you compare, I hate to bag on sabers and all that, but if you compare regimental training aid books on saber, you're training mass soldiers on mass how to regimentally use these weapons. Uh, does this change the nature of the finesse? Because it's it's not a finesse game anymore. It's a there's a, there's a finesse. Travis, don't kill me. Um, right. but there's definitely a change in the nature of the way you train people to use saber and saber is very much a industrial revolution warfare um, um, byproduct and yeah. saber is used all the way up until the 1940s i mean we were teaching people we were teaching the u.s army how to use saber all the way up into the 40s and 50s i think right so i think i think one of the questions that i have to ask when i think about <clears throat> to what degree does, does my fencing ability, right? My, uh, just my particular fencing ability to perform well 
in a very deliberate, very contrived context, right? I mean, we, we could have spent we could have spent the entire time here talking about all of the various assumptions that we just don't even address. We don't we just all of us just agree to these assumptions. What are what are those assumptions, right? There's a symmetry, right, in, in terms of weapon, uh, that we're starting uh, we're both starting at the ready. There's a, there's a sim, there's a symmetry in terms of our, our starting. Um, weapons are drawn. There's a limited battle space, right? You can't just run away, or you know. Um, there there are all sorts of assumptions that we bake into what what we're doing as as fencers, right? And I wonder to what degree my ability to perform well in that particular context directly translates to me being a better soldier, to to me being a more effective soldier whether it be infantrymen or otherwise right um and you know it's not clear to me that that the answer is unequivocally um it's more optimal for me to be a better fencer in order for me to be a better soldier than something else right so i'm not like i i would i think we would all agree that if you were a better fencer ceteris paribus you'd be a better soldier right but if you could use that time and energy at developing maybe your body movement, maybe your ability to explode, maybe, you know, various aspects about your attributes, various skills uh, and abilities, rather than just like a super, super astute tactical um, uh, disposition, right? Uh, maybe those, maybe the time is better spent doing those things, right? And, and so <clears throat> I guess, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that maybe what they discovered for was for the time and the place in the culture that it was, you know, it was less important for someone to develop this super sophisticated tactical game uh, played within this very, very contrived environment, you know? And I think, you, you know, I think that's manifest today when you ask the soldiers who say that they're not really as concerned with jiu-jitsu techniques or, or, or boxing, you know, striking techniques or, or other wrestling. Some of them are, right? But in, in general, right, there, there's a, a sort of predisposition that sees that as a, as a less important feature of their job. Um, and so then the question is, well, what are we trying to do for us, right? And I think one of the answers that I was trying to hint at earlier was like, Maybe what we're trying to do is be better at whatever, right? At being a man or a woman, right? Or just being a better, um, uh, you know, a more well-rounded martial artist for all that means. It's also okay for it just to be fun. To just, we're, we're really just playing with swords, right? Um, we're never going to recreate all of the very particular and peculiar ways that fencing enhanced the lives of people who were fencers in the 14th and 15th and 16th century. We're not gonna do that. Uh, but we can study history. We might be able to commune with each other. We might be able to express how we identify. We also might be able to commune with God if that's what we're into. And this is a vehicle for doing that. Um, but I think, you know, if we, I think one of the dangerous sort of mindsets to have is to think, I want to do this because I have this idea of what the ultimate what, right? I can't even, I don't even have a, I don't even have a sense of what it could be. But let's just say the ultimate warrior, right? For lack of a better toxic, you know, mantle, right? It's like, if I want to be the ultimate warrior and that's why I fence. Because I know how to do armed combat without weapons, with weapons, with ranged weapons, with melee weapons. You know, what, like, okay, if that's what you want to do, that's cool too. Like, I think, that's, I think that's great. But also, you're probably a product of a very particular blend of Puritanism and American 21st century machismo, as, as Jess Finley likes to point out. And she's not accusing any of you that I will I'll be the one to accuse you I don't want to worry <laughs> um, but no I think I think that it's also I also think it's okay to like be a martial arts junkie or just be a junkie of like 
steps, athleticism, and to try and understand and develop those parts of yourself for whatever reason you choose. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I've, I've become less convinced that fencing is a sort of, uh, like these sophisticated systems, sophisticated tactical theoretical models that are only applicable in this per very particular contrived environment that has no real world uh, uh, corollary, right? Uh, I've become less convinced that that's a pure stand-in for X, Y, or Z. And I'm more interested in how this activity can help me. Um, all right, take care, Craig. I'm actually done uh, basically after this, but um, how can help me do what I want to do better? Um, whatever that is. Any other questions? So can I, uh, sorry for not pausing time, really quickly though, going back to the original premise of why this exists and uh, going back to your, what you just said there, uh, I take a very brutish view on this. Um, I, I think things like this develop out of a need to survive and something that has appeared in many books and in um, many discussions has been, you know, people just needed to be able to survive a duel uh, for whatever reason, for whatever social context, why ever that was happening. Uh, this is not battlefield. This is something that you just need to survive. And if you look at the history of martial arts uh, going all the way to modern times where you've got, yeah, I, I, I agree the army, their reason for uh, army combatives is so that their buddy can show up and pull the guy off. Uh, Marine Corps, is slightly different viewpoint uh, coming out of Fallujah and other experience in Afghanistan and Iraq that, uh, guns run out of bullets and uh, I've met plenty of people who have killed guys with knives. Uh, it's, we realized that combat was changing and we had to be ready for all kinds of things. Um, these systems developed because of a need to survive an environment and I don't want to recreate the 15th century, but I am very curious about what it meant to live there. And I see this uh, art, I see this academic endeavor as a way of really exploring why was the sword made like this? Why was the clothing like that? Why did the armor cover this point? Why did the crossbow uh, have this little funny hook here at the end? Uh, all these different little things that help us understand the archeology, span the anthropology, and I, I kind of view it as combat anthropology. Uh, and I just wanna get your take on that, that simplistic view that this just comes from a need to survive. Well, so, so what I was actually going to um, respond with was more the, la the latter part of what you were saying, which is that this is archaeology. Um, I, I instead of instead of sort of beginning with a presumption about what this system, what this particular fencing system or uh, theoretical model of a of of a fight. If without beginning with an assumption about what it was meant to achieve, I'd rather look at it as though, you know, I look at it as though it was some pottery shard that I found in the ground, you know? How can this be a window into that world for me, right? Uh, does that make sense? So rather than, rather than saying like, I, I know, or I'm gonna begin with the presumption that they needed this fencing system uh, to perform X, Y, and Z function in their society, what the, the approach that I've been taking with this is rather, I love to see this system and as much of it as I can and to build a sophisticated and rich and nuanced and understanding of this system because it's gonna help be a window for me into that world. All right. Um, and I'm and, and and I may miss out on some things by not starting with some assumptions about what it was meant to do. Um, but I but I also I and when I approach it from this perspective, I, I get to not run the risk of interpreting the data wrong. Right. Um, I'd rather just look at the data and say, what can what can this data tell me? Um, you know, sort of discreetly about the world that I'm trying to better understand. 
All right. Anyone else? No, thank you. I like I, that. Uh, so, so I have a question. That, oh, go ahead, oh, Charles. Sorry. Oh, no. So, so one thing that's interesting to me actually is objects which um, straddle these, um, this kind of like only combat forever <laughs> mindsets and other aspects of society, which we know they cared about. Um, so, uh, you know, like the kind of the hidden punchline of one of my projects on is, is in concealed armor, which is I've got an object that needs to serve a very physical function, which we understand, right? Protect the wearer, but it's also got these, a secondary function that straddles, that that needs to operate in some other world that we're generally as martial artists not familiar with, right? So if I have a doublet and it's it's got, you know, armor inside of it, what are the dimensions of the doublet? What is the fashion? What 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 is concealed in that time period? Um, what are the assumptions someone makes when someone is wearing something about that um, with, you know, that cut and that shape? Um, how concealed does it have to be in order to be concealed? And what assumptions do we make about someone being armed in what context? And I think like, you're, like this this lecture is spot on, right? Which is that, yeah, we, we, we need to understand fencing and combat within a broader role of the of the participants who who participated in it i think and um a lot of the the industrial mindset like exactly i think you have it right there's an industrial mindset where my role as a soldier dominates both my occupation and my social uh context right i am a soldier and that's all i am i shave my head i got the camo that's that's all i am whereas you know in the 15th century these are these are the one percent. Like that's that's one way to see it. They are soldiers, but they're also um, they're also politicians. You know, they're also um, cons you know they're interested in marrying well. And what does that mean? You know, and how does that form the giant package that they're that they they are they are being right? I don't think we need to recreate that. I think you're right. Like we don't need to recreate that, but it's definitely worth knowing and always like, reminding ourselves. Uh, Marlene, what did you have? Yeah, I had a I had a question for you, and this was kind of like back in the beginning when you were discussing the different types of weight training. Um, so you focus on moving big numbers, like heavy, heavy, heavy items. And uh, yeah, was, in a modern in a modern in a modern context, I mean, they did. The, uh, so it's interesting. Um, Galen divided his uh, his categories by um, or his movements by mm -hmm. movements that develops um, or that you do with. Uh, from strength that you do rapidly and that you do violently uh and I, I i think that's i think that's interesting i don't have specifics about how they did their weight training mostly i know from other um sort of like anecdotal stuff like he lifted these big heavy rocks like that's what we kind of know about the particular yeah. way that they developed their strength training right we well, have barbells. i mean they're yeah. awesome and i guess my my question sort of surrounded why is there a deficit to training for reps with lower numbers as opposed to lower reps but higher numbers? Well, so it depends on what it depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? So um, when we're when we're talking about the ability to move, uh, you know, a large amount of weight, mm -hmm. the, if, you know, you're never going to move. You're never going to learn to recruit your muscles in such a way or grow your muscles in such a way that they'll be able to lift a heavy amount of weight if you don't lift heavy weight. Like that's the, the that's the rule. Um, okay. And so generally the heaviest weight that we're talking about is the weight that's going to fatigue your muscles uh, after a small number of reps. So we'll say uh, in the four to six rep range is sort of um, what most strength, you know, sport, you know, strength competitors. So strong men sports or powerlifting sports. They, they like to work in the four to six rep range because it's the range where they can move the maximum amount of weight a number of times, you know, the most number of times because um, it's like 80% of your max or whatever. You yeah. always want to be up in the 80% range. If you can mm -hmm. do an exercise 20 times, we'll say, you're not actually training strength. What you are training is muscle fatigue and recovery, right? So that's right. more getting into that endurance part of of what we're talking. If you're looking at <clears throat> resistance training, like a resistance training program, um, the way I would advise it is I would stick with 
uh, building your strength, so building that maximum number, mm -hmm. and then using uh, using exercises that harness sort of an explosive capacity of that. So, for instance, you start with a deadlift, then you do your hang cleans, right, or your power cleans. Uh, but then I would also work muscle fatigue in those areas, and there's various ways that you can do that. So, like, wrestlers, they use the Bulgarian bag. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bulgarian bag, but it's relatively light. So it's like maybe a quarter of what you would be moving otherwise, but you do all sorts of ballistic movements or maybe kettlebells, right? Might mm -hmm. be an example of something that you might do. So kettlebell swings or kettlebell snatches, the kind of stuff that's going to exhaust you over time. And you can train endurance in both of the ways that we've described. So long-term endurance, right? Moving at a rate where you're only going about 60 to 70% and not reaching your maximum capacity. So you're not washing your body out with lactic, lactic acid. Right. But then also, then also doing the same um, resistance training exercises with, say, the kettlebell, but doing it at such a high intensity that you have to stop. And so then it becomes more of a Tabata thing where you're going 10 on, 20 seconds off. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're really, like, you're really wiping yourself out. And what you're training there isn't strength, right? It isn't your ability to move large amounts of weight or even move them powerfully. What you're training in those cases is your ability to recover. Right, so it's like you're training fundamentally different things. It's not to say that one is better than the other. One is most certainly better than the other for developing strength, mm -hmm. right? And one is more better. One is better than the other for developing, um, you know, a lactic output or a lactic recovery, right? Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to do a lactic recovery exercises with your maximum load, right? Because then you're just going to collapse under the bar and get hurt, right? right? So you optimize your training for what it is in you that you want to develop. Okay. See, and I love this kind of stuff because it, it literally, well, not literally, but it very much is like we're training our body to do one thing and then we have to train our body to operate within a system, the lactic acid, you know, recovery and processing and all that. That is a system that we have to then train our body to handle and work through as efficiently as possible with a whole different set of movements and behaviors. But right. on top of that, if you add the nutrition back in, it's completely like <clears throat> totally different, right? Like you're going to eat completely differently if you're trying to build like bodybuilders eat totally differently than power lifters do, or than marathon runners or uh, dancers or anything, right? Like everyone, I love this stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, honestly, we could have done this on, <laughs> on just what to eat. Like, yeah. I, I mean, um, so yeah, so that I hope that answers that question. I could, yeah, I could spend a lot of time just on how, how we would approach these today. I would say uh, my key takeaway for how it relates to historical stuff is that they were concerned with both. Like they mm -hmm. knew that back then. They knew that there was a difference between strong exercises and rapid exercises and mm -hmm. violent exercises, right? So one of the exercises Galen um, describes is digging. So just being able to dig, that's considered a, you know, um, uh, 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 a, st a strength exercise yep. but then like to do it violently like I think that's yes. just I oh, think that's so but we cool. see this in like the the fort building and stuff too like their temporary camps like they weren't like if they were going to be holed up in a space like they would dig out they had post holes like and these the, like these guys are digging this stuff out and cutting these trees down and you can see um and I forget what markers they were looking for but in the archaeological digs they can gauge how quickly these um these encampments went up and it was like a couple of hours it was like a day to do this entire right. encampment for like 200 people or something like that that's nuts right so i mean so they so i i would, I would say that like even galen who's 200 and you know 200 ad or whatever had a sense of like there are various systems our, our own biological systems that we have to account for that we have to train uh yeah Digging is an <laughs> probably still a True. military. So is pulling ivy. Ivy sucks. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Uh, I think I've got one actually more at a, an instructor level. Like I totally agree. Like just the, the, the framework and the mindset that you laid out, 100% agree. Um, have you even thought about how to take like a newbie off the street, you know, kind of watch their Game of Thrones, <laughs> you know, they, they've, they've learned Team Alliance, they, so they, they think they know something, right, they, they've got some framework. Have you given thought about how you take that person and bring them to where you are now, or like, you know, somewhere close to it, um, 
you know, is it kind of throw them in the deep end or is it kind of a gradual hand holding? Have you thoughts? Uh, so I, I have students here. Um, some not, you know, some of them who kind of uh, embody some of the qualities that you described. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's good. No, no, it's good. So um, what I would say is I have, I've totally given a ton of thought to how I develop this framework for so, or how I help someone develop this framework. Uh, the most insightful quote that I've ever heard from anybody was from Bruce Lee in a movie, as a matter of fact, right? So uh, it's, I think it's Joe Lewis is in this movie with Bruce Lee, or maybe it's someone else, I can't remember who it was. But uh, probably not Joe, Steve McQueen, not Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was an actual fighter, um, not the boxer. I mean, the karate guy. But Steve McQueen, actor, trained under Bruce Lee. They're in a movie together. And I don't know if his mom comes down and she's like, what are you doing? You're doing this. You're wrecking the house. And he's like, ma, ma, this guy's going to teach me kung fu. Right? And Bruce Lee's like, I told you already. I cannot teach you. I can only help you explore yourself better. Right? I thought that was the most profound. Like I couldn't believe it. Right? Do you know how many hours you have to spend teaching someone a thing to arrive at that conclusion? Like, do you know how much effort and thought and thinking about like what is a concept? What is this thing that I'm responsible for teaching? before you get to the point where it's like, no, there is no spoon. There is no spoon, <laughs> right? It's just you and your body and you're operating in this world. And we sort of, we parameterize it a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that helps, that makes what we think we're teaching make more sense or be more applicable. Right. But the truth is, the only way that you actually help someone learn is is by sort of like i mean I, I, let me take let me rephrase what i've discovered is that the more i learn the more sophisticated my understanding of all this becomes the less sure i i am about whatever you know any any of the things that i'm saying <laughs> yeah. um and and i think that's the natural way of it right i think People learn a thing and they absorb just enough where they can expand their box just a little bit, right? That's it. And you can't pick which things they take away from yeah. the lesson, right? Or yeah. like they, they're only going to pick just enough relative and they're only going to pick the things that are most contextually and functionally relevant to them in their life in that moment, right? Yeah. And you have no choice what that is and there's no way like is there an optimal way to do it i mean i don't know that's presuming you have all of their motivation right it's presuming yeah. you have a perfect understanding of all of the things that they're looking to achieve from engagement with this activity um so so yeah i have given lots of thought and what i've arrived at is my role is to provide them with consistency a consistent framework that they can use to continue expanding their horizons. But it's all uh, to use Devin Borman's sort of framework. It's all a scaffolding, right? It's all a scaffolding. The idea is I'm trying to, I'm trying to help build and I provide them with this framework and that framework helps them reach higher and higher levels, newer and greater heights. But the, the point of the scaffolding from the very first the very first platform that I set up, the point is to take it down, right? The point is to remove the scaffolding so that what they, what, what they experience, what they understand exists on its own terms without any help from me. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think the way that I have decided I can do that is provide a consistent framework that they can rely on, that they can expand gradually and easily and accessibly. Um, but my goal for everyone is just to get to a point where they can start, you know, and it's cliche, but it's, you know. It's not the, though. It's not cliche right. at all. Right. And the, right. Yeah. I'm going to jump in a little bit because 
this cat's trying to eat my sandwich and I'm not okay with it. Um, but if you look at ballet specifically, um, I studied the Cicchetti method, but I also dabbled in the Vaganova method. So the Cicchetti method is the Italian approach and Vaganova is the Russian approach. They're very much the same where they have a framework. These students come in and they do their planned curricula for the level at which they are. And then like a belt system with Eastern martial arts, you have to test out of that level before you can move on to the next level. And they take you up through like pre-professional to professional. Like at this point in time, you should be able to rock a tutu and have perfect alignment and churn out 32, you know, forte turns. But they do the same thing where they build the scaffolding and then they take it down gradually as right. they teach you how to dance, essentially. Well, and, then, and, and, and the goal for them is to like be like, you don't need my scaffolding anymore. You know how to dance. Yes. Right. You, you know, but that's against the rules. Well, yeah, because you need the rules. Right. But my goal for you is to not need the rules so that you don't need to worry about whether or not you're breaking them. Right. But the only way you can do that is constant engagement with this thing and, and a, developing a deeper and deeper and more profound understanding of it uh, so that you understand the, 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 um, the very sort of uh, the, the levels of nuance where slight changes matter. You know, um, you can say, don't cross your feet. But really, cross your feet, that's wrong, right? So what, what's cross your feet? Cross your feet is just a shorthand. Cross your feet mm -hmm. is just a shorthand for don't align yourself such that you're strong one way and weak another. And actually, you can be strong and have your feet crossed, yep. right? But we don't say that because if you say, oh, no, you can have your feet crossed, you know, does that make mm -hmm. sense? All right. Any other yeah. questions? Would you be willing to do something like this again, focusing on a different chapter of the same thought? Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, I can, I could focus. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would totally. Um, <laughs> what, I'd, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is I want to um, share kind of my intention today was to go through and share my own personal training regimen. Um, so like specifically looking at how I program these various ways of training and what aspect of my martial arts that I'm trying to sort of develop and hone and, um, uh, and emphasize in each particular training area. Um, so that, that'd, be, that'd be fun and interesting. But before I did that, I wanted to kind of flesh out what it is that we're trying to achieve with those things. Like why, mm -hmm. why we're concerned with those areas, why we might want to train, why they might want to train those areas. Um, how it's accessible across cultures uh, within our own culture, how some of the areas in their culture that um, that development might have served them well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's it. We've lost a whole bunch of people along the way, but uh, yeah. but no, but that's good. We went way over. I was expecting eight o'clock to be done, so <laughs> I had it a good time. Is. It never is. The fact that it went on this long is a good sign. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. I'll take it. Anyone else have any questions? All right. You, got, you, no. you, you guys have my contact information. So if anything comes up, I'm uh, yep. always more than happy to, to talk about this kind of stuff. Yep. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, Thank, oh. thank you for hosting. The, Is it the, late yes. night time? Right, right. As soon as we stop recording, it's like HEMA after hours and we get to hang yes. out. <laughs> Brent, stop recording. <laughs>